All right, so the format is called dialing it in. Um, and uh, the uh, three things I'm going to go through are what does this format actually look like? Um, how can one contribute to it? Um, and then we'll go through an example. So we'll have some people who have dialed it in already, and we'll, we'll go through what that means. So starting with uh, what it is, um, it's meant to be uh, a very user-driven model where people offline, when you're working at home, working at the office, if you have ideas, questions that you're running into, just make a quick little video of, uh, of, the, of the, the question you have and send it in. Um, in the format today, what we're going to do is, I mean, if, for, for a lot of people, by the way, I mean, standing up here in front of an audience, regardless of the size of the audience, is not the easiest thing to do. Some people don't want to do that at all. And actually, a lot of times, it's just, it's in the moment that you have these, these ideas, these questions. So it's, it's just a, hopefully a different way of capturing things. And, and potentially, we'll see, I guess, if this pl uh, plays out, um, it's a way to ask a visual question in, this, in a way that's different than an audience just auditorily asking a question. So I think there's going to be more, some more details showing, by example, here is some code that, I, that I'm having a problem with. Maybe that'll engage people in a, in a different way. So that's the idea. Um, I think that um, the, there'll probably be um, one to three minutes. So we'll, we'll take the kind of Twitter approach to duration. Uh, we can't have people going on and on about their, their, their problem. But three minutes this should be enough time, hopefully, for you guys to kind of uh, encapsulate what, what the, the, the problem or idea you have is. Um, and then um, how many questions we do will really come down to how many questions you send in. Um, sending the questions in um, is just a matter of sending it to an email address, either dial it in at emberlondon.com or dial it in with dashes in between. Both of them will work, so just send that in. Uh, what we're looking for is um, your name. I, I guess you can do it anonymously if you, if you thought uh, this question may be quite silly, so I'm just going to put it anonymously. That's, that's fine as well. Um, a, a title for it and the, and the link to the video. You can choose whatever site. I, we, I think I mildly right now prefer YouTube, but it doesn't really matter, whatever one you're most comfortable with. Uh, also, if you want to put your Twitter handle, uh, a JSBin, or whatever it is that you think is, is relevant to this, throw that in there as well. well. We'll include it, but you don't have to. So we're going to go into some dial it -ins. We have some uh, an anonymous people who have, have dialed in some questions just to, to, to try out the format. But before we do, let me just ask the audience, uh, does the format make sense? Is, any questions about the format? Pretty straightforward. When you say creatively, Asking a question, what, what does that mean? Does that mean editing together something, or is that just you showing yourself typing or talking? Um, well, I think I don't want to necessarily constrain that too much right now. I think it probably is open to your imagination. You'll see in the format that uh, these anonymous uh, uh, users uh, chose this time, it's fairly similar, where it's more about looking at a browser, at a screen, at, at, at the uh, terminal, and, and, and seeing a little screencast. Uh, but it could be, it could be you uh, as a person just sitting there you know, showing your face and asking the question. That's fine, too. It loses some of the advantages you might have, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's, it's too early to say no to, to any of these ideas. Any other questions? Any other suggestions? Again, suggestions are fine offline, too. Uh, let me know afterwards if you think there's some ways that this could be done differently or better. Um, so what time is it? It's time to dial it in. <laughs> okay, uh, so the first question comes from John Smith. Um, and John is asking the question, how does the, when you're using Ember CLI, how does the testing vary between uh, the command uh, from, the, from the terminal and from the browser. And I'm just going to click on his question. And hopefully, oh. Oh, I clicked on the wrong thing, didn't I? Huh. Jamie, which one do I? Uh, I try to click on this video link, but it uh, doesn't seem to be working. It's just advancing slide. Let's see. We do, we do have the links in Basecamp, I think, so we bring those up. Yeah, 
I think you can probably also just click on that. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, oh, no, that's a different one, isn't it? But if you go to question one. Yeah. Thing in the corner. Oh, well, let's just get, grab that link for now and then we can. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so question hey folks, I uh, just wanted to ask a quick question to the group about um, testing. And specifically, what I'm looking for is an understanding for uh, what is different when you run testing in the browser versus from the command line. Um, I've got here a simple app. It's got, you know, almost nothing really in terms of code. There's, there's, a few, there's quite a few routes and so on. But basically, the tests that exist are those tests that kind of come out of the box when you use Ember CLI. So if I go to the browser and I reload it, and what you'll see is that it runs 115 tests and 115 pass. Uh, I'd expect when I go to the Ember CLI that I'd get the same sort of result. So if I said Ember test, <clears throat> you see that actually it isn't the same. Uh, first of all, there's two things that are different. One is there's only 109 tests, not 115. So what happened to the missing six tests? And and lastly, there was a failure. So you know you can see that a lot of tests are the same. And I'll go up to the failure. So here's the case of the failure. Um, and it's about a component being rendered. Um, other components are rendering fine. So again, I, I, it's not so much about this this specific error, which I'm sure I can figure out. It's more about the process that uh, Ember CLI is setting up for me, and how is the testing process different when I run the tests from the command line versus from the browser? OK, so that's question one. Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, part of this format, what it means is that um, there's, there's effectively work for you guys to do. You, you can't dial it in as now being an audience member. Uh, I didn't come with the answers. John asked that question. I, I thought about it a little bit as well. Um, but um, but has, has anyone experienced this before, where they're seeing variation between the tests that are taking place in the browser versus the tests that are taking place in the command line? Does anyone have any idea why that, that variation might exist? So that, um, can you pause it on the... Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 Different when I run the tests from... There we go. So it's yeah, there's, so there's a hint in there, isn't there, I think, uh, in terms of what is going on. It's, it's, it's small print, so it may be hard for people to read, but... Down here, if you look at the small print, um, it's talking about a problem with the bind function. Um, and for those of you who are aware of it, there's a problem with PhantomJS being able to uh, attach to bind. It's not implemented in, in PhantomJS. So that particular error that I was pointing to is actually a result, probably, of, uh, of just that. So there are some. Um, ways to get around that, but that, that explains the failure. I still actually don't know what the answer is to the variation in the number of scripts that are run, so 115 versus 109. I don't, I don't have a clue as to why that is different. So, the, um, so PhantomJS doesn't support function.bind out of the box. You've got to polyfill it, and I actually think that's a feature rather than a bug because it keeps you honest because IE8 doesn't support function.prototype.bind, and there are various other browsers that don't. So I've had this error a few times, and it's really useful. It's like, it means Phantom is quite a good canary in the coal mine for all the browsers. Yeah. I mean, it, it, won't, it won't stay that way, unfortunately, but. Right. But well, Google will stop using uh, IE8 as well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but but not for a while. Yeah. yeah. Has anyone seen the, the problem of a different number of tests being run headlessly than in the browser. Okay, so maybe we'll retitle this Mystery Science Theater 2000 instead. But um, 
it is, um, I'd be interested in hearing, and I'm sure that uh, John's, John would be interested as well, um, in hearing if anyone does come up with this problem and is able to determine why there is a variation there. I mean, it does say that 115 assertions of 115 pumps, is that the same as test? Or can you say one more than one assert in a test? Well, that's a good point. And it's possible that maybe some of the assertions were blocked because this this failure. Can so we that, see the, um, yeah, that's a good point. Can we see the, the, the end of the test output? Uh, yeah. Oh, um. I think you do show it. Yeah, you about six in that one time. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Command line versus from the browser. It was earlier, wasn't it? Yeah, it's earlier. So I think nomenclature, my guess is that tests and assertions do match up. Um, I mean, they're too, well, I don't know. They seem too similar in number to not be meant to be the same sort of thing. Um, but, if it's assert, but if it's assertions, then it's possible. Is it possible that uh, we're just, you know, some, some assertions were not run because it ran into the line problem, that was it? Seems possible. I don't know if that answers the problem, and, and uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask John to look into that, and he can he can come back to us on that. Do you know if the um, that that bootstrap component? Do you know if it was one that uh, that John had installed from Bauer, or was it one he'd written himself? Uh, it was uh, in, indeed one that he had written himself. Um, so it, so yeah, this was this was wrapping a, a jQuery widget, um, and. I, I don't actually remember um, uh, if John and I talked about this, but I think that he was saying that um, he had taken the code from uh, Amber add-ons, but I'm not sure. In, in any event, it, it isn't, um, it is, I think it's likely that it's basically in the, in the attempt to wrap a jQuery um, uh, product, it's, they, they use line and, and that's caused the problem, especially, or certainly if people are using supporting IEA. Okay, so let's move on to question number two. Um, and oh, it's over here. Okay. So I've got a relatively simple Ember project, which is using Ember data. And when I first started using Ember data, everything I was doing was pretty much looking like this. I was basically setting an attribute, but I was giving it a string or maybe a number or possibly a Boolean attribute, but that was it. Um, obviously the next step up is to start to define relationships between entities. So in this case, what we see here is that there's three properties and they all have belongs to or a one-to-many relationship with the users table. And um, this isn't uh, really my question is not, not how to use the belongs to relationship, um, but more that um, there is a particular case I'm running into where um, a get request to user might fail. I don't actually have permissions to see the um, user, uh, a different user's profile uh, effectively. So this belongs to would immediately kind of without automatically go and make a get to the user table and it would come back unsuccessfully. Uh, I don't know if I should, if there's any benefit at all to using a belongs to relationship in this situation. I mean, I could obviously just change this to be attribute string, in which case the own by property would still be a, a foreign key reference for lack of a better term to the user table, but Ember Data wouldn't go out and try to uh, make the get requests, which would ultimately fail. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just new enough now to not understand exactly what I'm getting out of all these relationships. There's some obvious things, but, you know, is there a reason why I should still hang on to using this belongs to in this use case 
and uh, if so, how would I how would I do that so that I'm not uh, negatively impacted by the um, the unsuccessful guests that would that would come out of out of the box? I forgot to mention this. This was dialed in from uh, Jane Weiss. Uh, Jane wanted to apologize. Normally, she, her voice isn't so low, but uh, she had a cold. Um, the um, so I think the question could be maybe raised up a little bit of a level and, and just be about you know when you're using Ember data, there is um, the basic semantics of defining the, the the model, but then there's also the relationships. And I, a lot of the power comes from the ability to have those relationships in place, but are there use cases, are there scenarios in which uh, you, you might want to move away from the relationship and just kind of dummy it down a little bit, change a, a foreign key uh, relationship or what, what have you to be just a string or, or a number, I guess, if you're using the numeric system. Um, so that's the question. Has anyone come into a situation similar to, to Jane's? purpose of that value is anyway. So what's the what are you trying to resolve by having the owned by or the entered by value? Uh, well so it's it's um, in other use cases where um, you know there there's a useful relationship where in this case we're talking about an activity. Yeah. Uh, the activity has an ownership uh, by a user but in, in some of the use cases you may have a user who doesn't have permissions to have to see the the underlying user um, but what's the, in terms of the presentation or the interactions or the actions around that relationship, mm -hmm. is there, is it any, is it a trivial uh, type of relationship where all you want is the name of the individual versus something where there's a greater degree of complexity where you need to be able to act upon uh, some sort of action related to that individual? So in other cases, what you get kind of out of the box by having that relationship there is, you know, you have a whole user profile to yeah. come back with that. So if I wanted to go to a screen in which I was able to talk about the user and their name and, and other attributes about that user, that would all be kind of made available to me kind of out of the box. Um, and that would be some of the benefit I'd take away from it. But in this case, obviously, I'm not doing that. So um, I think... Uh, Initially, when I you know, when I first started using Ember Data, it was in a pretty rough form. It's much more refined now, getting close to being a 1.0 release. Um, and I think that there was some caution on my part initially, or on in, in Jane's part in this case, um, that um, maybe um, uh, using the base functionality, just the, basically the modeling and not the relationships, it seemed, that, it seemed like that's where all the problems were coming in. Uh, I just stay away from that. Um, I'm, I'm now taking the opposite approach and trying to use it in its full capacity, but I'm just wondering, again, if there are cases that people have run into, they just feel like, for whatever reason, uh, they want to work around and data. So in this case, you, you ask the model for owner. That goes to make a GET request for the, the ID that it sees, and the server comes back with a 401 or a 404 or something like that. It would be, uh, was it 403, right? Unauthorized, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, so, successful guess that would... so I guess the question is then, I assume that Ember Data at that point throws an error into the console and things sort of like jam up. What would you, <coughs> what would you like to, to happen just for that, um, for that owned by to resolve to just null? Or well, so in the case, if I set this to string as I have here, what would happen is I would pull back the record. He would have, let's say, let's say the user in, in, who owned this particular activity was user one. Um, that would be, you know, uh, I'd be able to see that user one was the owner of this activity, and that's fine. But it would not actually go out and reflexively go and request uh, the user profile for one getting this error. So I, I'd basically be able to, you know, have this model defined once, ignore this in this case, in this use case. I'd be using the other attributes, which I do care about and do have access to. Right, so in that case, back to Tom's question of how do you actually display that value in the UI? The owned by? Yeah. Well, so that's where I was saying. I mean, I think that the, in the, in the case of uh, having it set to a string and, and what I'm trying to avoid in this use case, you wouldn't be displaying it. The point is you're actually not displaying owned by. It's that, and the reason you still have it in the model is because in other use cases, with someone with a different set of permissions uh, through a different use case may very well um, you know, have access to or rather, if you're the, let's say you're the owner of the activity, you'll be able to use that owned by link to basically uh, navigate and see you know, all the user profile information as well. Um, it seems like there should be some option to prefetch. 
Well, so you're, you're right. There, there is actually something, I don't know if, I wasn't sure if someone would mention, mention this, but there's this idea, at least, um, of being able to load these relationships asynchronously. Um, so as part of the configuration, you can specify that this relationship is an asynchronous one, and therefore, when I make a request for this, um, it doesn't actually automatically go out and do anything. So it's only when I start to ask for this directly or ask for attributes off of the object that it points to, uh, does it go out and make the get request? So that's probably the easiest answer to the question is just setting it to uh, to asynchronous. And, so and in fact, not, if it's not async when you request this model, does it do the other requests as well? It does. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, and, and apparently, so that's either going away. They're well, no, they're the changing. The, they're, they're changing the default. I know yeah. they're getting rid of the flag. Uh, no, I don't think they're getting rid of the flag, though. Um, but the yeah, but the, the default was to have it be synchronous, and now they're changing around. So. I, I think that belongs to. I'm not sure whether this is already the case or not, but I think that belongs to when it's not async true assumes that you have already loaded that you, you already have that other user that it refers to in memory. Like you have to have manually gone and got that model loaded in as well. And if it's async true, then when and only when you request that property, then it will go before the, the Ajax request and you basically get a promise model that you can say if it's failed, succeeded, mm -hmm. anything and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my friend is fuzzy on it. But I think there is an interesting question of, even if it was just inconsistency and you didn't mind, so say you had a, um, say you wanted to show the owner, but it's possible the owner had been deleted, and in, in that case you didn't want the app to just fail, you, you would want it to just like fail silently and just go, I don't have an owner, it's not a big deal. So at that point, I'd imagine you could um, adjust the adapter, perhaps, and override find belongs to to just um, do something a bit different in the rejects case. Just swallow the error, or just like okay, report it to one side. Okay, overriding belongs to, okay. F yeah, find belongs to, I think is the, uh, the hook. It seems to be crying out for what you guys are talking about, is having some sort of promise or behavior where if it's not got access to the object, you can have a default yes. register value. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if this is even a problem in the Ember data, or that we should be talking about Ember data um, to solve. Like, it seems that the problem is that the server has given you an ID for a user that you're not able to access, and you need to think carefully about what you want the behavior of the app to be in that case. Like, maybe if you're not authorized to see that um, person, the server should not have returned their ID to you. Um, and if it is that you want to see their name, but not but not the whole thing, maybe the server should actually just be sending back the name. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more like a, a whole problem. Like you'd have this issue even if you weren't using Ember. If you've got any JavaScript application where this thing could be related to something else, but you can't don't have permission to see. Yeah, that. I think that's like, fair. What, should, what behavior should the app have in that, that that case? I think that's really what we should be talking about rather than rather than like... I, I so so when I, I think when Jane asked this question, you know, she was thinking about things in a, in a, in a different way than she is now. Um, I feel comfortable <laughs> saying that. Uh, um, and, um, and, and, I, and, I, and I would say that, um, you know, what, I, what I'd like to do in, in this question area, and again, I don't actually know in the audience how many people are actually using Ember Data, but kind of raise it up a level and not have it be too specific about this use case and be more about in their use, people's use of Ember data, are you finding situations where the kind of the, what it's giving you, you actually want to work around at times? Are there exception cases that you'd run into, uh, or is is the framework solid enough now at this point that you feel confident in, in using it? I think a bit more flexibility does make a lot of sense if you could, um, it, yeah, uh, if this return the promise. Uh, Right handlers for success and error. Uh, I'm sorry. If if these if these did return promises in the right handlers for success and error, like um, say the belongs to relationship, so you can find um, yeah uh, to I don't know. I just um, I'm just going to bring up the docs. For yeah, sure. When you've got async true on. Uh, you get back a. Actually, I'll be You 
you get back a promise object. I think you do in both cases, don't you? No, I think with, with the synchronous version, you either get null or something. With the async version, you get back a promise. So synchronous is basically saying you're expecting the data to come back sideloaded, and, and so therefore yes, exactly. the, the master record will come back with all this yeah, either, references. Either it will be sideloaded or a root up in the hierarchy will have already loaded in off all the relevant user records. Um, so you get, let's see, where is it? Promise objects. I, I was thinking about this in relation to how the data originally was with the like, hydrated models of this post with the same thing. Um, so it's a it's like a it's a promise. So so then you can chain down to it and treat it like any other promise. But when it resolves, it proxies all the properties of the object that it's resolved to. So you can like you can take this promise promise object, glue it into your template, and access properties off it directly as if it you so you can treat it both as a model and as a promise and it'll work in, in both ways. So this is um, like this is something that's worth knowing about and there's a, there's a um, sibling to it called well there's promise array and promise many array but this is what you get when you've got when you've got an asynchronous has many so like when you've got either a, a bunch of embedded IDs to related records or when you've got one of those uh, link um, properties you'll get one of these promise arrays back and it's it's like it looks like an array when you want it to look like an array and it looks like a promise when you want to chain it then onto the end of it and like, deal with this whole project so yeah, and it has a bunch of properties like is pending, has failed, or has yeah. failed, or whatever. So in your template, you can say if yeah. you know, people has resolved, then display them. Yeah, I was, actually, I've got a little example if of something I did today where I like I needed to work around Ember data, and I was really pleasantly surprised by how easy it was. So, so I guess I can see it. This is sort of related. Mm -hmm. It's like a similar problem space. So, um, I'll just show you the, the code I ended up with. It's not like necessary, necessarily complete. Um, So the problem I had was um, I've got a bunch of favor uh, favorites in an application, and the way you deal with them is like you hit edit favorites, and then you toggle on and off various different things, and then at the end you hit you hit done. And so I wanted to batch up the saving of all those favorites into one API request, and um, Ember Data doesn't provide that behavior out of the box. It does provide the batching up of fetching records. But not persisting them. So I was like, "How do I, how do I do this? How can I accommodate this?" So I created a a favorite adapter. So you can see the file name is app adapter's favorite. Is, that, is this big enough for everyone, by the way? Yeah. So it's a favorite adapter which extends the application adapter, and what it does is just. And I wanted to I, I wanted to make this change for any sort of operation. So creating new favorites. Uh, updating existing ones and deleting old ones as well, where in order to delete a favorite, you just set it to delete it flag to true and then send it over the wire and the server takes care of getting rid of it. So those, these are three hooks that you can override, create record, update record and delete record, and they all have to return a promise. And so what I'm doing is just, for any of those operations, I'm just scheduling one of these batch updates and scheduling the record into it. So. Um, when it happens, I either create a new batch or use the batch I've already got. And this batch has like, if this is, this is a, um, I'll show you what this looks like in a sec. So you've got this notion of a batch, which is a bunch of stuff which is going to happen like next. And then just add this record that we want to schedule into, it, into that batch and then return the promise off the end of the batch. And then what batch looks like, it's a really tiny little class. It's just an array of records and then this callback for when you're allowed to go and actually do the work. And it just uses ember run next to stick this operation into the queue of the next run loop. And it's just going to call back to whatever its process callback was with those records. So 
really all this object does is keep track of this array and then give it back <coughs> at the right time. And then batch update is just like a little bit of custom serialization of those records into the payload that I want, that I know my API expects, and then returning the promise of that AJAX operation there. And so this for AJAX, that's the AJAX uh, method given to me by the adapter. So that's an ember data thing. Uh, similarly, build URL as an ember data thing, serialize. Those are all given to me by ember data. Siri not available. Connect to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I said Siri, <laughs> or hey Siri, or something like that. <laughs> um, build your, so most of this is provided by Ember Data, and like I was really delighted that, that Ember.run.net just did exactly what I wanted, because if you imagine what I'm ending up having to do in sort of further up in the application is a bunch of favorites have changed. When the user hits done, I'm just going to call save on every model in that array, and then I don't want to have to worry about it anymore. And then down in the application of that, so it's doing this job of like tidying them all together into this one batch update. So this is this is my example of uh, how flexible Ember data is now, like how easy it is to hook in. And note that this is just for favorites. Every other type of model in this system uses regular kind of REST calls. This, this one just happens to be different and weird. By the way, what Jamie just did here, uh, running up and, and demoing stuff in, in either looking at websites or looking at the command line. Command line might be a little bit harder for people who don't have laptops, but if people want to do that, that's open game. Uh, feel free to. Um, Oh, Thanks. By the way, if anyone wants to uh, try out a bit of code, I've just got like a, a dummy, like freshly generated Ember app sitting on the on the desktop. So if you want to try and like recreate the code or something like that, then please come to do so. Okay, so let's move on to the last question. Okay. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar already with Moment.js, um, and my question isn't about Moment.js uh, by itself, but it's more about how to use Moment.js effectively within an Ember, and specifically an Ember data environment. Uh, what I'd like to be able to do is be able to specify in some of my uh, Ember data models that um, a particular attribute is either a date or a date time uh, type, and when it is, it will when brought into the Ember universe, it will immediately be wrapped as a moment object, so I can work with it as a moment object while I'm working with it, and then at the end, I can save it, and it'll go back out to the RESTful API as just a string format. So um, that's actually, that that part of things is is pretty straightforward in, in, to start out with, and I'll, sh I'll show you what I mean. So here is um, a transform uh, object. So in this case, what I've done is I've taken the date um, and I'm saying, if you choose date, it will come in, it will wrap the um, string that's coming in as a moment object, it will then bring it to the beginning of the day so that all the time information is effectively lost. And then at the end, when I'm saving it, um, it will deserialize it by putting it back into a string format. And that works, there's no, there's no problem with that. Um, the, the problem, however, is, is that now this property in the Ember data model is a moment object, and if I change that moment object, I will, um, it will no longer be observable. So my question is, is there a way that's, that's relatively straightforward to maintain observability so that I can work with it as a moment object, but if it changes things like the is dirty flag, uh, so on and so forth, get changed uh, as they would if it was just a string. So just as an example, um, I'm looking at the uh, Ember Inspector. Uh, I've got a model up here, and I'm going to go ahead and assign the E variable to um, the model. So if I go over here and I can just check quickly, I mean just get is dirty, which is a way for checking if that rec this record has been changed, and in fact it has not. Let's change something simple like uh, I'm going to say e set uh, type 
to foobar and we can see that is dirty is in fact true right now. If I save the record, ignore those messages, we can now get ourselves back to a false is dirty state because we've saved it and it's back to normal. Everyone's happy. Um, okay, so we want that same behavior, you know, that I, I set type to foobar. I want to be able to set start time to some other time than it is right now and have the same sort of uh, effect um, take place. So here I can say I get start time and I'll see it's a moment object. I can kind of look into it and see, oh yeah, well, so it was uh, December 18th at 4 p.m. Um, what if I wanted to change that to say Christmas? Um, so I'll just go ahead and say, Set start time to start time. Okay, now let's get start time. And okay, well, we set it to 1st of January. The end result is we have changed it. Um, so let's go and take a look and see if after all that, our flag is dirty and the answer is no it's not and that's because start time we change attributes within the object but the object itself is not observable by the ember system so therefore ember and then ember data are unaware that anything has happened or anything has changed okay so that was from jack um the um does anyone uh, have a view on? I, mean, I think we could we could we could talk first of all if anyone has a view on whether Ember uh, Moment JS is an appropriate uh, form to transform into. But I, I am more interested in the observable thing because it's, it's it's more broadly applicable. I mean, whether you have some sort of a, a nested object uh, that you want to maintain its observability, that also would apply. Moment is just an example of that. Um, but people run into this. People come up with a solution they think is uh, best of this. I think in this specific case, you can just call clone on the date before you then set it, and then it's a different instance. I don't imagine that's what Ember Data is checking. Um, I don't use Ember Data, but in the ORM that I use, that worked, I think. Um, that, that when, makes, when you call set, it just all. Well, well that, that would make sense, right? Because the reference has changed, and that, 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 that initial yeah, reference I guess is observable. Yeah, more clever when you set to check if it's the same as it was before. Right. Um, but if you clone the moment, before you so it's more about the, the internal it. state of, the, of an object, you know, being able to change, manipulate the properties within that uh, and still have the obser observation that things have changed. Yeah, you basically new instance of it, yeah. yeah. Perhaps it would be helpful if we could define a method of transform to compare two instances of the object, because as we can see a referring to cross parties of the graph, for instance, here. So okay. if we compare, we just have the other cases, as well. like if we have more complex objects. So maybe have an add-in or something like that, that that is able to be used instead of just the the, the Ember. Yes. Just more plug. Would you plug that into the Ember system? Uh, yeah, it, I guess it would be added to the Ember. I, I think there's a related open pull request to use is equal as the uh, to compare two objects when you call set. Okay. Just remembered. So when you call set, it'll check with I think triple equals whether it's the same as the value that was previously there. And if it right. is, it won't bother calling any notifications. Right. Where in this case, that would match if it's the same instance, but the data itself has changed. Right. Whereas there's a pull request to make the users equal instead, and then you can implement your own is equal to check the two versions. Okay. And then that might help it. I don't know. But there's performance concerns whether or not that will get merged. Okay. Any other thoughts on? Question. Is there a way to capture that through the set, the set itself, and then, and then sort of be able to flag those, those attributes to kind of have a different flow of uh, Well, I don't know how you mean because you could over override sets. Um, this, so I think one approach you could take would, would be to wrap the moment object in another object, which is kind of embryo something that 
something that can notify property changes and kind of like translates the moment API into something that's a bit more Embry and can can notify all the right objects of mutations. But yeah, it's a um, in, in this case, it feels a little bit silly with the M, with the, the moment JS object, but actually, Jack did something similar to that uh, in that um, you know, not for this particular problem, but actually, you know, where there was a dictionary of, of, of attributes that were basically showing up in the model. You had a uh, property called markers, and markers was really just a whole bunch of name value pairs that were existing off of that. So in the transform object, uh, what Jack decided to do was just to go through and in the transformation process, make sure that all of those objects were Ember objects that were inside the root object and make them observable. So it's, I think that's similar to what you're talking about with one of the JS, right? Yeah, yeah and it's like I, I've done, I've needed to do something like that for taking something like the local storage API and treating that as if it were just any other Ember object in that you can plug it into a template and have it be observable and have it, it's all about observation, isn't it? It's all about it, it triggering changes when you expect it to. And I found the easiest way to do that was just to wrap <coughs> the local storage object up inside a, a class and uh, just do special things on get and set and then call notify property change at the right times. And then that allowed me to hook into, um, there's a, there's a top level DOM event for when when local storage changes from another tab or another browser window and that allows me to sort of capture that and just turn it into a proxy change notification. Okay, so if there aren't any more comments about question number three, let's just quickly reflect on, on the format. I mean, obviously I was very lucky to be out drinking with Jack, Jane, and uh, John. And, um, and they all volunteered to do this before we even had the format in place. Um, but is this something that um, you, you guys could, I mean, just a show of hands, would, would, it, would you consider putting your own question into a format like this? Okay, that's good. Right, and, and, and is there anything about the, uh, the way that the format is run that you think would, would make it better? Is there, is there something that would make the ability for Jamie or someone else to run up here and start typing at the keyboard, anything you'd want to have available you think would be? Supplying code samples with the video would be useful so that you can actually, because okay. the first one is very difficult to comment on it without seeing code samples. Okay. Yeah, almost like a JS bin link with the, a recreation of the problem if it's possible to do so. Okay. And would that be then, I guess we'd print that out. Well, we can figure that out. Um, but or just, but even just when, as people are talking, you can refer to it, flip to that window. Right. Refer to it, right. maybe make a live change so that it can, in a sense of doing a lot of hacks, actually. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you think you oh, put the, yeah. um, the question and the conversation together on the forum? So it's quite, so it's quite easy to sort of see, you know, see the question and then see the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And in fact, yeah, we should post all three of these to the forum yeah. afterwards so that, because, and, and the answers that came up in this session yeah. as well. So for those of you who raised your hand, <coughs> dial it in at emberlondon.com. Uh, his email address, and we'll look forward to seeing more questions as you have them. What, Thank did, you. Um, what did Jack, Jane, and John use to record their questions? Uh, <laughs> well, um, I, I only talked to Jane about this actually, so I can only speak for her in this case. Uh, but um, she, uh, she used uh, Camtasia, um, but uh, Screenflow or Camtasia are the two big ones, and then I'm sure there's a million other ones, but those ones work really well. You can use QuickTime on your Mac as well. Okay, great, thank you. All right, let's hear it for Dylan. <laughs>